I want to thank uh, Boston Children's Hospital for their support of us so we can offer these programs and present uh, CE. Uh, there are no potential conflicts of interest to disclose and no commercial support for this program. And with that being said, I'd like to in introduce our speaker who almost needs no introduction. I'm pleased to introduce this evening's speaker, Patricia Flatley Brennan, who is currently the director of the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. The National Library of Medicine is the world's largest biomedical library and the producer of digital information services used by scientists, health professionals, and members of the public worldwide. Since assuming the directorship in August of 2016, Dr. Brennan has positioned the NLM as an international hub of data science. She has spearheaded the development of a new strategic plan that envisions the NLM as the platform for biomedical discovery and data-powered health. Dr. Brennan has a Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of Pennsylvania, a PhD in Industrial Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, following several years of clinical practice in critical care nursing and psychiatric nursing, Dr. Brennan held several academic positions, most recently at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Brennan is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, holds a fellowship in the American Academy of Nursing, the American College of Medical Informatics, and the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. Her professional accomplishments reflect her background, which unites nursing, engineering, information technology, and clinical care to improve the public health and ensure the best possible experience in patient care. In addition to her day job at the NLM, Dr. Brennan's research laboratory at the National Institute of Nursing Research develops interactive virtual reality experience to better characterize patients with complex chronic conditions such as diabetes and heart failure and the context within which they live. Dr. Brennan was originally scheduled to keynote our 2020 trends program, which we obviously did not occur due to the pandemic. Pandemic. So I wanna thank her very much for hanging in there with us to find this opportunity tonight. We are honored that she has taken the time out of a very busy schedule to speak with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brennan back to NEMIC. Thank you so much. Well, I have to tell you, you all have a secret weapon that, that makes me, me always willing to come and speak to Nenek, and that is the, the friends that I have met and made through Nenek over the years. But in, in particular, I'm not sure many of you on the call know that actually Denise and I have continued to work together. And Denise serves as the nurse consultant to our audio or sorry, advanced visualization branch laboratory at the NIH. And we've been immersing her in virtual reality for about two years. And she's helped to really bring a, a team of people who come from very disparate backgrounds, psychology, engineering, computer vision, together to think about the problems that patients have and how we might use immersive virtual reality to address those problems. And if we want, if we have time at the end, you want me to talk or maybe have Denise talk a little bit about what it's like to work with that team and what we've been doing, we'd be really happy to do that. It's really an exciting time. Um, I'm going to put, uh, bring my slides up and I'm going to get us started. In, as I prepared for this conversation with Denise and Mary, I understand that the challenges that are faced by many of you in nursing informatics have been almost earth shattering, un overwhelming, unrelenting challenges in the year. And tonight I am coming not to give you sound sage advice or insights from the government, which of course we love to do, but I'm coming to actually spend some time with you to, to expand the skill set that we all need to have as nurses and in the nursing informatics field to be able to, to not only manage this pandemic, but prepare for the next one. So in order to do that, I'm going to have a, a lot of audience participation activity tonight. So all of you who are in the car driving, you just do these activities in your mind. Please don't try to do them while you're driving. But I want to start off with an activity that will open up your thinking about yourself and the world around you. 
I'm going to give two sets of instructions. One will be for those of you whose surname begins from the, in the letters A to M, so in the first half of the alphabet. And the other set of instructions will come to those of you whose surname begins from N to Z in the second half of the alphabet. This is a, a brief exercise to really get you started thinking about new ways of thinking. So I'd like you to begin for those for those whose 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 surname is in the first half of the alphabet. I want alphabet. I want you to begin by creating a doodle. Now this is not a poll for a meeting you have to go to. This is a, a unstructured drawing. If you have a pen and paper close by, pick up the pen in your non-dominant hand and move it close to the paper. If you don't have a piece of paper or a pen close by, this is not for the driving people, by the way, I want you simply just to take your finger and place it on the table in front of you or on a piece of paper in front of you because you'll be using that to create your doodle. For those of you who are in the second half of the alphabet, you don't need to have any equipment with you. You just need to be ready to close your eyes when I say to start and conjure up the most pleasant image you can think of warm waves breaking on a beach, family around a table. Just focus on that image. Don't worry if your mind wanders away back to work things or what you're gonna have for dinner or how you have to get the car fixed, but just come back and stay with the image. Now, each person is gonna do the activity for 30 seconds when I say go. Are you ready? Go. Okay, we're done. Thank you. Stop. How is, what was that like for you? Where did their mind take you? What does your doodle look like to you? This experience was one of expanding your imaginative skill. We're going to be talking a lot tonight about cultivating imagination and the steps that one can take to do this. Imagination is an important companion in the ability to thrive during a pandemic and drive to a future. And we'll be returning to this exercise and talking a bit about the experience. I want you to reflect though about two more things. One is how long did that 30 seconds feel? Did it feel like it was a long time? 30 seconds, that goes by quickly, but it felt, feels long when you're concentrating on not concentrating, when you're distracting yourself from everything else in your life. That's why periods of imagination are so hard to enter into our fast moving life right now. The second question that I have for you is what, where did your mind go? Were you able to take it to a, a calming space or did you find yourself, the moment you stopped thinking, you started thinking again about work, about family, about issues. That experience of intrusive thinking has been very effective for us as nurses, especially in nursing informatics, because we're able to process a lot of things. But it doesn't necessarily stand us in the good in the long stead when we're trying to actually create solutions that are responsive and useful for a long future. So tonight I was asked to address a couple of critical things based on our experiences at the NLM. What kinds of innovations arose at the NLM during the pandemic? And how might these innovations help nurses, you as nurses and uh, informatics and you as the nurses you support, improve patient care by extracting principles for systems design and implementation? We'll try to address both of these during the time. I wanna begin though by reflecting with you what a year we have had. This has been our a full year now since October of last year where we're already experienced in the global pandemic. Many of you have already been back to work for longer periods than, than, I, than I have. We are certainly, the NIH is on complete telework still. But the pandemic continues to perplex us. It changes, it drives new questions, it brings new challenges to us. And the challenges we face from an informatics perspective have to do address both the, the urgency of the pandemic and now the endurance, the long-term constant persistence of what was to be a short-term experience. 
Within the, the last 18 months, we've certainly developed a growing recognition of disparities and inequities in our health systems that were highlighted and, and led to differential experiences, both of the coronavirus infection and of the care that individuals got. This growing recognition and our need to respond to it has shaped what we need to be doing, both as in my case as a federal employee and in all of our cases, how we're going to care for patients while we try to discern what are the elements within our system of structural racism or other kinds of barriers that make access to care difficult for individuals. We have also experienced a period of time where there are more refugees and displaced persons in the world than there have ever been before. Estimates are between 85 and 100 million individuals are displaced from their homelands in forcible relocations or in forced uh, dis dispersions and ensuring that we can manage this process of providing basic needed services, potable water, adequate food, and also response to the pandemic for this 100 million people who are displaced presents enormous challenges that we have yet to have experienced in our lifetime. And finally, the economic disruption that has occurred around us has led to mo the most peculiar things from toilet paper shortages to worker shortages, the lack of individuals finding work still meaningful and important when it's disrupted in ways, the challenges that having sufficient funds to be able to support oneself when one is out of work. All of these things come together in the strategies and the, the framework that we have around us now that we must build towards a future. We have recognized that the pandemic that we're experiencing while we experienced it as a novel experience is actually slum, somewhat expected, at least was foreseen over the last 20 years of increasing evidence that infectious disease was expanding throughout the world. In addition, the pandemic that we have has uncovered both challenges and opportunities for going forward and ensuring that we are able to meet the healthcare needs of society. It's also revealed, frankly, the limitations of the way we have built our health information infrastructure. And we'll be spending some time to talk about that. But I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about what it's like to have been part of the NIH during this period of time, during this period of the pandemic response and maximum telework. So on the screen in front of you, you see the two buildings of the National Library of Medicine. We actually have space in five buildings. We've grown so much. There are 1,700 women and men that work at the National Library of Medicine. Some of our materials are quite familiar to you, PubMed. Maybe you've worked with uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Maybe you've been involved with research that makes use of our genomic databases like GenBank and dbGaP. 1,700 women and men have been working on maximum telework for the last 18 months. There's about 12 people in the, across these two buildings um, that have been managing to keep our data services alive. We have faced a tremendous amount of challenges in understanding new models of supervision, new ways of interacting with each other. The National Library of Medicine continues to meet its mission every day. We provided a, 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 an increase in our number of research grants that we awarded to the world. We now provide over 200 research grants every year. This is, has doubled since I became director. We continue to conduct intramural research. I'll be talking a little bit about that. And of course, continue to have our services. One very important part of the National Library of Medicine is the network of the National Library of Medicine. The network of the National Library of Medicine is 8,000 member network around the country in almost every congressional district in the US. We have a, library, a public library, a hospital library, a, a academic health science library. And this network has provided us with a way to both connect to the community and learn from the community. The network has also proven to be a wonderful structure, a lattice that the NIH has been able to embrace as it's attempted to respond to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and the COVID-19 infection. We are able to make use of our points of presence in all of these communities in support of the SEAL network, the, the, the strategies to reach underserved communities with information, vaccine and testing strategies. So we provided a ready-made platform on which the NIH was able to exploit. In the last year, the NIH has received over $2 billion of new funds to respond to the COVID pandemic. And that has challenged us to create new models of research and rapidly deploy new kinds of research activities around the country. 
we've learned a couple of important things in this last year. We, we, one of the biggest innovations we learned is how to work through Zoom. I'm sure that's, not, that's been something that each of you has had to deal with in your own environments or with your families, family dinners over Zoom. We, we, we meet with my mother every, every Monday or Sunday night, rather, and bring the family together. But from a workplace perspective, we've moved from what you see on the left-hand side, sitting together, pointing, using our bodies to engage people in interactions, to this very flat experience of looking at individuals on a screen, maybe 12 inches away from our face. It's been advantageous in, in many ways because we've been able to have meetings such as this where people can come together fairly easy. It's been disadvantageous in ways where when we really need innovation, we need to come up with new ways of working, new strategies for interacting. We've learned that some of the things you can do in Zoom work very well and the things that you can't, we're really struggling with. How do we keep ideas flowing? How do we keep creativity moving? That's part of what's inspired my talk this evening. Relative to our issues in informatics, we've learned a great deal about the importance of data systems. We recognize how critical it, would, it is un, during a period where we have an unfamiliar disease with an unpredictable trajectory that we need lots of information, lots of data to be able to characterize the experience of the illness and to understand how to intervene. My own operation has been deeply involved in understanding the, the various the variants of the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, my, uh, se sequence rather, and we, we have now over 300,000 sequences stored in our data banks. The, ver the, the process of determining whether or not something is a variant is in itself a fascinating experience. But what's become really critical at the NIH is the need to have clinical information, near real-time clinical information that we, are we would be able to use to both understand the course of the disease, prepare therapeutics in a rapid enough fashion and determine how effective our screening and vaccine strategies have been. Obtaining near real-time data from clinical information systems around the country represents an enormous challenge we have yet to solve effectively. We've been trying several different approaches, including using the, the Clinical and Translational Science Award Network, which is the CTSAs, which is a network of about 80 medical centers it's essentially exporting data on a weekly basis about selected cases. We found that, get, that, that obtaining data and harmonizing data is it, it represents a huge human cost and millions of dollars have gone in to figure out how to determine the, the experience of patients by looking at data. And yet what continues to be missing is the understanding of the human response, how an individual is coping, what family dynamics are occurring. We've also recognized, and the NIH has invested heavily in data repositories so that the data captured during this pandemic can be available for future studies over time. Obtaining data it during from research projects or clinical care systems and making it secure and safely available for future research requires, of course, engaging the patient in the conversation, engaging the participants in consenting processes, also requires significant harmonization of information. And we're placing in the repositories information that we hope will be helping us not only manage this pandemic, but address the next pandemic. We also have recognized and because of our greater, much greater awareness of social factors in data, we have constructed data repositories that preserve data from Native American communities separate from the data from other communities in the US, specifically because our tribal nations have said their, mo their models of access and control over data sets really does differ from the, 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 the typical way we approach data use. So our, as we built new data systems and created new ways to collect information about the pandemic, we've also had to be on top of the ideas that the cultural implications of what data means in communities have to be respected as we go through this. The challenges that we have faced have been very much the required the balancing act between supporting science and addressing public health issues. The National Library of Medicine, by and large, is a research supporting enterprise. Our purpose for being is to maintain the literature and the genomic databases to make sure research continues and goes forward. But we've had to rapidly pivot all of these resources for public health so that now our sequence alignment systems, which were used originally to determine 
the uh, protein structures of various uh, disease processes now are being used as part of the public health response to determine where the different variants of the coronavirus are being, are being exposed. This requires a shifting of a lot of rules. For example, in the concept within public health, data should be released as quickly as possible. And under research models, data can be embargoed until the researcher has effectively leveraged what data can be, what can be made of the data they've collected. So switching our, our mechanisms to allow for rapid release of data in a way that still preserves the public's need and the, the researcher's right has been an important challenge we faced. We also have moved into new research environments. On the lower right-hand side, you see a water treatment plant. There's a great deal of interest in trying to find non-invasive ways to detect spread of, of, of viruses, particularly right now the, the coronavirus, but in general, other viral diseases. And there's a lot of interest in testing wastewater for the evidence of disease or of shed cells that have been shed to determine whether or not we can identify hotspots in communities where we could then bring in more closely the testing opportunities and the, and this, the contact tracing to be able to contain those new, new hotspots for the pandemic rather quickly. This whole process though has changed the culture of the NIH very rapidly from one that was exclusively research support, long vision, create new science to get out in the public and address testing because of, and, and, and vaccines and, and therapeutics. Because of the investments that have been made at the NIH, we now have 2 million tests available every day for individuals and for families and, and schools and communities around the country. We still believe we're behind in this, but what this shift has required is a move from the NIH from its traditional research model to partnerships with industry to be able to more rapidly deliver the tools that industry needs. I would submit to you that never before has the world needed nursing more than it does right now. We have, we have challenges where nursing can take interventions. We can address the pandemic. We, can, we, we need to support and, and clarify the, 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 the traditions that have led to mistrust in science address the growing impact of structural racism and nursing informatics is critical for doing this. We have spent a year and a half facing unprecedented challenges in unprecedented ways. And so what I'd like to ask for your participation now is to uh, take a moment to think for a moment and then add into the chat one example of a never before experienced event or situation that you have encountered in the past year. If you can enter it in the chat now, others will be able to, to, um, to share this. So I see mass fear. Um, I assume that's not Massachusetts fear, but fear across others. Isolation, um, helping seniors get into onto Zoom for church. The challenges we play, we the exacerbation of the loneliness is uh, an, is an incredible, scary aspect of the pandemic to me because of what we know about the relationship between isolation and then shortening of lifespan. Social isolation is as dangerous to people as cardiovascular disease can be. The challenges. Um, of changes of care, I'm seeing shortage of supplies, working from home without, uh, without um, uh, with, and balancing child care needs, an unprecedented fear of not of leaving home and not or of not having adequate food, substance use, suicide, um, the working from home, the social isolation from colleagues, decline in, in elder health, the lack of physical touch. Many of these things that are being identified are 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 worrisome and are unfamiliar and the challenge of nursing to respond to them um, is great. The, the need to find a way through this process. And what's intriguing to me and what I'm seeing uh, in, in the, the chat is the challenges are experienced in these in all across our lives, in our work life and in our home lives. They're, the lack of of, of, um, of distinction between workday and end of workday that are telework families 
have had to, to deal with is really astounding. The challenge in, in discovering that friends and family's attitude about masking and vaccines is, is quite different than our own is incredible. The feelings of empathy and sympathy for those who have died alone and wondering how much can we do, do uh, to address that? What can we do? How much do, what can nurses be, what role can nurses play with this? And there is a, is a significant emphasis in nursing right now, which I see as a, emphasizing the emotionality of nurses and the, the nurses at the bedside. We, we, we saw the beginning, the, the pot banging and, and the, the, this pour, outpouring of emotional support, which missed in many ways the incredible complex problem solving that these nurses had to do. Now we're seeing a shift to the, the, the unrelenting drain on nursing talent and nursing um, nursing resources to, to uh, destroying the morale of most of our field. And what, part of the reason I'm having them taking this time tonight to talk with you about this is that I think self-care is the first step we must take to remain resilient and be able to prepare for the next pandemic. Addressing self-care in part requires us learning new ways our skills at problem solving and rapid response are useful, but they're not enough to help us come through the challenges that we're facing now. From my perspective, I saw the, 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 one of the critical challenges that we had in nursing informatics was the persistent, unrelenting response under both uncertainty and urgency. There was no time to think. There was a need to have. What I saw in my colleagues at the NIH was an expectation after 20 years of ignoring clinical information systems, the expectation that one could press a button and have all the clinical records of the world delivered at once to NIH was astoundingly naive. The urgency with which people wanted response and the public nature of the investments and the uh, awareness of treatment strategies at the NIH was, was very, very high on the list. But in addition to that, our technologies are still built on practices that are almost 25 years old. The idea of, 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 of care practices requiring a team of authorization for access to, to either PPE or therapeutics to have require a certain single signature, the ability or inability to have information delivered at the point of need, collecting information from a number of platforms has been a real limiting factor in the way we are able to practice our care. The hybrid compute platforms, the emergence of cloud-based computing and, uh, and apps-based computing and mobile-based computing has left us in some ways with more points of information and less ability to integrate and access that information. And we see that challenge coming in with the rapid embrace of AI-powered care. The, uh, the, the movement of artificial intelligence into clinical practice is an exciting and somewhat frightening step that's happening now in the sense that we know that it, within AI systems, we, that they are as good as the data they are built on and the ability to perpetuate bias within AI is a significant concern. This is an area where nursing has the ability to, to make actions, to make, some, make progress, but it is a challenging area for us to work in. There's a rise of patient engagement, but a, a lack of the proliferation of the tools to support it. That is, the tools are, 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 are isolated and clustered. When we tried to do contact tracing or tried to initiate uh, the automatic notification, we found that much of the public either did not trust health information appearing on a phone spontaneously or it did not, did not understand it, so it was ignored. So we, we, have, we have a perception that people will be in the moment with us we don't have the tool structure to support it. And finally, and this was mentioned by several of you who are in your list, these, there are, uh, there's an increased reliance on remote care and telemedicine, which brings with it some advantages and some conveniences, but also we lose the ability to smell a patient, to be able to touch someone who is fearful, to be able to watch how their body posture changes when they speak of certain things. We must find ways to build these back in. And nurses are doing amazingly creative and important things. So I want you to move to my next audience participation activity. And in, in this one, I want you to post in the chat the best solution that you developed in response to a challenge you faced in the last year.
simulation. I'm assuming that's educational simulation, the, the ability to practice and develop new, uh, to, to, to provide educational experiences without one being there. Thank you, that's good, that's exciting. Zooming with friends and family and outside gathering. Um, I saw something about the, earlier about the CMS waiving the, the, the care planning process, which some people saw, I think saw as an advantage. Um, the, the, uh, the staff, in, in changing the access of staff to, uh, to, to devices, um, walking in meditation, um, walks in meditation and daily exercise. These are self-care steps that I'm really, really happy to see there. What other kinds of, of challenges, where did your creativity come into play in the past year that really helped to, um, to, to you or your colleagues or your clients get through a process? Um, I, I, I have to say, Juliana, I love that I, moving away from the new normal to the brave new world. This is a new way for us to be and our opportunities to help shape this is, is going to be incredibly powerful if we can retain the hope and the, 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 the resilience of our nursing community. Um, pivoting to virtual CE, turning off the news finding ways to use video training where we might have used personal training. These are all strategies that we, we are, are advantaging, taking advantage of the content around us and the tools around us to be able to do the things that we need to do. I find myself really wanting a motivational kick some days though, because I, having to remember to do more to, than I, to, to get outdoors, to exercise in the midst of the, the 17th Zoom of the day really changes me, challenges me. Um, someone mentioned more homemade food. I have adopted a whole food plant-based diet this year. I don't think I could have done that if I was going to work, but I'm, I'm home and my, doing my work from my, my den. So I'm able to control my life more. Taking advantage, taking stock of the skills that we've been in and the resources that we have to use now is a part that will bring us to the future. I want to, add, to have you turn with me now um, to the, the, someone mentioned thinking outside the box and doing things we never could do as quickly as we did. I want to work, work on thinking outside the box a little bit and spend some time talking with you about imagination. The way one prepares for the future that you've never imagined is by cultivating imagination. In order to recognize that we we're, we were all so stunned by what happened. No one thought this could happen. We have the opportunity now to think about how do we build a skill to begin to anticipate a future that we had never imagined would happen. This requires a way of thinking about imagination that I hope you'll find helpful in your own work and your own life. <laughs> For those of you who are in the car, we just watched a one minute video that took you through some periods of hectic clinical scenes out to a beach, out to an open park, out to a place with other people with the message that imagination is what will help us move from how do we get this done to what if we did it this way? What if we did something new? I'm talking with you tonight about imagination as the ability to envision what one has never seen, experienced, or heard about. 
Imagination is the ability to envision what one has never has never seen, experienced, or heard about. Now, nurses are pretty familiar with the concept of imagination, and we use it in a number of different ways. We're certainly all familiar with guided imagery, where we walk a person through a series of sensory cues to be able to either relax or become more comfortable in complex circumstances. That's an important type of imagination, but it's not what we're talking about here. We also are used to imagination as a brainstorming or design technique where we're asked to think about a specific problem and target in on the various approaches we might take to that problem. That again is a type of imagination, but it's not what we're talking about here. This imagination that I want you to be thinking about, I want you to become mindful of, is like the experience we did in the very opening of this session tonight something where you clear your mind and begin to open it to ideas that may come through. It is not purposeful, not tied to a specific problem, but rather a type of strategy that one that allows you to be open to a different awareness of yourself in the world. Now, uh, there are many scholars of imagination. Edgar Casey's my favorite, and he actually separates imagination into two concepts spontaneous imagination and controlled imagination. Spontaneous imagination, what I'm speaking of right now is effortless. It has a surprise category to it and an instantaneity. You don't control it, you experience it. Controlled imagination actually is a very purposeful mental activity where one goes through a process of initiation, usually by thinking of a specific topic or theme, follows a particular set of guidance, and then the imagination period ends. It has a fixed beginning and end point. Both spontaneous and controlled imagination are important for design. They're critically important skills for nurses in informatics to develop because they bring us awareness of future states and solutions to those acquiring those future states that is, will be important to our patients and to the clients that we serve. But I want to take a little bit more time talking about the spontaneous imagination because it might be a little less familiar to you than the controlled imagination. Spontaneous imagination fosters creativity in nursing informatics. If you think of it, spontaneous imagination is like wool gathering or daydreaming or fantasizing where your mind really doesn't fix on a specific problem or situation, but simply glides, simply is open. And I've, I've already, I can already hear some thoughts going on in the room about does she have any idea how busy our lives are? When are we going to do this? We'll talk about that too. But I, what I want you to remember is that we, you only had to do, spend 30 seconds to start this off tonight. And it's possible to have these brief periods to develop the, the skill of spontaneous imagination. It does require time and it does require practice. And it requires us actually to let go of our purposefulness all the time in the service of the future that we're trying to design. Why does it work? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here tonight taking a risk that I've moved away from all my research, all of my scholarly stuff to say, come with me and envision because I've reviewed the research and I believe in the experiences of opening yourself to imagination brings as much powerful change as the response of meditation. And some people identify meditation as one of their, their activities for this year. We know from studies of fMRI and studies of, of, of uh, physiologic response that, that as it, cultivating imagination and spending time in these brief to extended periods of ill-focused thought actually has the same impact as meditation does, a calming of the heart rate, a changing of the mental patterns, of the electrical patterns. It opens people to the creative process. Again, like much like, much like meditation does. Individuals after periods of, of controlled, uh, sorry, after periods of induction of spontaneous imagination show they have a broader problem solving skills. They have a different assessment of what they are capable of doing. Their self-evaluation changes and their sense of self-efficacy expands. And I believe it works not because it replaces the skills that we've come to, we've come to rely on, but it complements them in very important ways. Imagination to me is one of the most important tools you can bring into your sack as you face the future. 
Imagination stimulates ideas. It improves confidence and enhances creativity. After periods of imagination or people who have cultivated the skill of imagination are better able at generating thoughts that they have never been had before, generating new solutions on the fly to problems never experienced. They have the ability to envision technologies that have yet to be made rather than determining what we can do with technologies. And for nursing, so important for us is that imagination has the ability to help us treat the human response, not with prescription, but with production, engaging our participants, our patients, our colleagues in a process that creates the future rather than responds to this. Now I'm bringing this particular topic of imagination to this group because part of our job in nursing informatics is to be innovators, is to bring innovation into the information management resources and processes of clinical practice and patient care. So I, I introduced the concept of imagination to you as a way to stimulate and, and expand our abilities to be innovators. Innovation fueled by imagination has several benefits that we don't see and several aspects that we don't see in other approaches to problem solving. Using and cultivating the skill of imagination increases one's ability to recognize nuances and triggers in situations, becoming more aware of the experience. It also assists in expanding the design space beyond the original set of constraints that one, one focuses on, in part because the focus is on what if rather than how to. Your mind is open to different pathways, different thoughts, different ideas. You ha have the imagination has the ability to help highlight consequences not previously recognized and can increase one's ability to tolerate uncertainty and resist premature closure. Let me stop on that line for just a moment. One of the challenges about the workflow that we see in healthcare today is the urgency of response, the need to keep moving, the need to get ahead of the challenge that's in front of us. And often that, that sense leads us to select the first most satisfying solution. And in fact, we find that individuals who are used to working in a crisis mode have a lower tolerance for uncertainty. That is, getting a situation resolved reduces their distress in the situation. So solutions are selected in, in a manner that reduces uncertainty. And that may well work for this, a particular moment in time, a particular in time. But in the long run, to prepare us for a challenge we have yet to even envision and put words around, being able to bring along the skill of imagination helps us be able to recognize novelty when it's in front of us, recognize the opportunities that might be there. And again, to envision the future state where you want to be, where you need to be with a patient situation or a clinical challenge before we figure out the pathway to arrive there. So because of an increased tolerance of uncertainty and a re reduction of premature closure, we're able to focus more on the end state rather than how we're gonna to get to that end state. Is not a tool to be used alone. Every, we, it's part of the tools that fits into the skill set that we need to have. But in particular, we as nurses need to have this for three critical reasons. First and foremost, and nursing informatics knows this the best, we must advocate for the data needed to understand the patient experience. What we recognize over and over again, if we don't stop to imagine what data we will need we will be forced to work with the data we can get. And I am convinced that our understanding of complex, uncertain experiences and illnesses such as the, the COVID pandemic require us to, to be mindful of and advocating for the data that are needed. Now, at this point in time, when we're focused on clinician burnout and reducing the interference of electronic health records in the patient care process and minimizing uh, charting so that we don't have to, uh, we don't overburden our clinicians, advocating for more data may sound very odd, may sound like I'm sort of like an academic talking to those who know better. Why I want you to pause with me and think about this is because we must think about data in a smart fashion, not presume that every data element is going to need to have a spot within the EHR. Every data element must be preserved forever, but think about how to use data smartly and make sure that the data that we need for a situation is available rather than presuming that the data we, we've grabbed in a situation must be preserved forever. 
I'm actually arguing that in order to characterize the phenomenon of concern for nursing, we need a language infrastructure. We need to think differently about the terms we use to describe a patient's situation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the reason why we, we want to manage those terms. We have spent, my career in nursing informatics began in the 70s. We have spent a long time listening to some of the great thinkers in our field that basically says, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. If you didn't count it, it doesn't matter. And while I agree that that has a place in nursing, when we think about trying to understand the concerns of a patient and communicate them either back to the patient or to others in the care team, we need a different kind of language infrastructure, one that is less focused on the accountability model and more on the understanding model of nursing. And that's where nursing informatics enters the stage. The third reason why I'm advocating for this with the nursing informatics community is that it is our responsibility along with our colleagues elsewhere in the health information technology system to preserve trust and provenance in a highly distributed information environment. Right now, we've been willing to continue to require that the patient remembers and we have the electronic system and that we allow for information tools that, that are supportive only of small parts of practice like institution-based care. And as we move into the future, we want to build an information environment that is trustable and retains the accuracy, the, 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 the characteristics of the data, but to do it in a way in a highly distributed information environment. And we have all as nurses experienced the excuse me, a range of information tools from the, the piece of uh, paper towel that where blood pressure was written on to asking a patient to bring their drug card out of their, out of their wallet. We have the opportunity to think differently about information and its role in our patient's experience. And because of our specialized knowledge in nursing informatics, we understand the technical system and we understand the clinical system and we have the opportunity to bring them together, but to bring them together, not in a purposeful way that we understand now, but in an imaginative way that takes us into the future that, we, that could be. I believe the generation of solutions based on technology should always follow the design of the nursing practice. And that's why careers in nursing informatics are so critical to the health of our whole society, because we can envision the practice, the practice components, and then apply the technology if we preserve this process, if we preserve this awareness for our, ourselves and our patients. So now we'll get to the practical point of the evening that a couple of you have been waiting to when is she going to get into the real world with us? How do we do this in the real world? How can I possibly be telling people who are overworked, 14 hour days, not enough staff, not enough supplies to spend some time imagining, opening your heart and your mind to new ways of thinking, not about a particular problem, but just to open your mind. I submit to you that your first best practice here is to spend time cultivating spontaneous imagination. Give it a few weeks, try it with me. I guarantee you, you're gonna find a change in, in your ability to experience the environment. A 30 second interval once or twice a week can bring you to a, a different kind of awareness, quieting your mind, Selecting an indefinite focus, not problem specific. That's why I had you either make a doodle or, or uh, envision a pleasant situation because there, you're really in the process of generating spontaneous imagination. You're trying to be opening of the space in your mind to allow new ideas to come through and be patient with the practice. It is the practice itself, those, that one minute in two 30 second intervals twice a week will be part of your practice of building your skill and spontaneous imagination. Gradually, gradually carve out time and space and schedule. Some people try to have imaginative sessions daily. Some people are a, a little bit more like we where they have them when they remember them. And, and sometimes we wish we had more. But what you're really aiming for is a period of time of about 15 minutes, at least once a week, where you empty your mind and open your framing. That's all it takes. 
And this spirit, this experience of quieting the world around you and leaving yourself open to thoughts is not going to generate the next new nursing informatics idea in your mind, I guarantee you. But what it will do is it will open you to awareness of different types, of different sounds, of different ideas that, that will make your, give you the practice of experiencing less purposeful, more open-ended thinking. Now, to get your work done, you've got to develop the skills and controlled imagination. There's no question about that. There is a production side of our work. And not surprisingly, the design activities that, are, that we learned through the pandemic are really, really critical. I have to tell you, we start in most of the pandemic response at NIH, and my guess from what I've heard when I've spoken with nurses in practice, is we started the fifth bullet. We started the choice. What should we do now? And that backing up a little bit to what is the problem, what are the requirements we have and the constraints we need to address and what kinds of solutions might we use and then choose, that process is too, feels too long, too uncertain. But remember, by cultivating spontaneous imagination, you're increasing your ability to tolerate uncertainty, to push away premature closure. And so allowing these two to develop in concert is gives you a better chance at coming up with solutions that may be more likely to be aligned with your internal values, the goals of the patient, the goals of the system. The third thing you need to do is to build capacity and support in your system because almost all of us work in a system. And I guarantee if I was sitting on my Zoom call with Francis Collins, having my imaginative experience, I don't think he's gonna to be too impressed with it. There's, we have to find ways to build environments that encourage imaginative thinking. So I have a couple thoughts about creating a workspace where imagination drives innovation. And the first is something that we're learning through our intense self-study on structural racism and the challenges that NIH faces, that is the need to develop diverse work teams, diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of, of cultural or heritage brings better solutions into the conversations. Creating a workplace that values achievement over compliance will actually assist in making it possible for people to take multiple pathways to the same to, to a good solution state. And if we focus on the, the, the end game and whether that end game is 20 minutes from now when the patient's pain is relieved or the end game is two years from now when we've got a new protocol in place, focusing on the achievement rather than the compliance of how to get to it is a great, of great assistance. Interpersonally, in small group situations, challenging quick associations is a very powerful tool, as well, particularly when it's used as a way to, to tell me why, tell me more about, as opposed to how could you think that? What's the matter with you? Now, while none of us will say that, well, maybe few of us will say that out loud in a public meeting, a lot of us say it in our mind. And that, that idea the association that we're making is the quick association I'm trying to help you break. Finding a way to break our patterns of association opens the idea, opens the thinking, the processes to the capacity for more imaginative solutions. For the managers in the group, it is critical to cultivate a management style that is results oriented. And that results oriented has to be driven by what we as nurses in our profession have agreed to society we will provide, as well as what we as workers in our occupation, in our institutions have agreed to produce. And so the results, the, the ability to have high level nursing practice begins with high level nurses, but can only flourish with high level nursing management. There is a need to improve tolerance for trying new things and failing occasionally. And I know that in a, in a pandemic response where the sense is we, we, need, to, we need to respond quickly, we need, to be, we need to be knowing what to do immediately, we are always going to be failing. We are always going to be having trial and error. We even, our famous Tony Fauci said initially, no masks, and then started to say masks. We always have to try the pathway, but the ability to have tolerance for trying new things and failing occasionally is way more important than the ability to be right all the time. 
as managers, as leaders, as nurse consultants, as nursing informatics specialists, we have the ability to stimulate search for novel information and our ability to carve out a design space or a conversational space with our clients or our colleagues or our nursing staff is a part of the process for searching for novel information that may in fact improve an understanding of a circumstance, improve our ability to respond in an appropriate fashion. The responsibility is to, in the workplace should be on managing the process, but focusing on the outcome. Where are we trying to get to, not how are we trying to get there? I'll be interested in hearing your comments about this, especially if there's other alternatives that you have to thinking how we can expand our design space and make it possible. Each of us has a different set of operating principles in our lives and imagination can support each of us depending on where we align on the ideas of innovation and imagination. If you are the person who believes that progress towards a goal comes in measurable steps and those measurable steps are meaningful and important, your thinking is incremental and the ability to expand through imagination isn't gonna necessarily change your, your, the idea that you have that progress towards goal comes in measurable steps, but you'll have new uh, ways to envision what does progress mean? Where does the goal step in? Those of you who push a little bit harder um, to, to overcome barriers of thought and tradition are considered to be breakthrough in, in, in innovators. Breakthrough innovators get, enjoy the process of breaking through uh, thoughts and, and traditional barriers. And the imagination here can help focus which are worthy of your attention, which are worthy of, of bringing forward a, a, a radical shift. A transformative innovator shifts from maintaining business to achieving the outcome. If every business, every operation, every hospital, every clinical group needs to have a small number of transformative thinkers to push into the further, furthest of directions. And so as you're looking to create an environment that has capacity for imaginative thinking, making sure that you understand the, the, the skill sets the incremental breakthrough and transformative tendencies of the people you work with will help make sure you have the right set of individuals pulled together. So we have our last audience participation activity right now. And I want you to take a minute to write into the chat, what can you do to cultivate imagination yourself, among your team or with your clients? Not to be afraid of failure. That's that's important. That's important. Not, I'm I'm I tend to be an embarrassed type person. I don't like to be embarrassed. A leap, being willing to take the leap. Love the doodle exercise. It is. It's very simple, isn't it? Asking more questions, create a culture that embraces innovation and imagination. Being open minded. Challenge yourself, showing others, active listening. Yep, these are great. These are really good. Share these exercises with teams, work on imagination, looking for new ways to solve issues. Do not feel intimidated and don't let anybody have that power over you. Absolutely right. What if we had a million dollars to build? What is it? And take, take time away from all devices, allowing failure, uh, allowing failure and not gleefully experiencing the failure of others is something that's really sometimes I have to remind myself of. Um, I also find that um, I have I am challenged to take time for imagination when I feel that I am the only one that can solve a particular problem or handle a particular situation. So Mary's comment, build a team, is actually the very important piece for me to remember that it's not just about me. And the solution that I might have, I may like the best, but it may not necessarily be the best for where we're going. Taking in the experience and knowledge from novices and seniors and seasoned nurses. Absolutely. Understand that, there, that we each have knowledge to bring into a circumstance. So I'm going, I'm going to close with a, a diagram that has helped me over time understand um, ways to think about intervening with patients as well as in myself. And that is what we call the hierarchy of imagination. And this is on the screen in front of you now. 
in our practice and in the everyday lives of patients, the very bottom is of the pyramid is the most common place of activity. Reflexive activity, immediately an instinctive reaction to external stimulus. And actually, nurses are really good at this. We get, we kind of value our quick response and just getting out there fast and being able to be on top of stuff. It may not be the best long term. So we need to figure out why in the moment is it the most satisfying. Coming up, moving up the hierarchy, we see problem solving activities that nurses are, again, always also very good at. Problem solving is creativity constrained by reality. Often someone has street smarts or has the ability to execute. And problem solving really has its focus, has its, has its focus fixing something. It doesn't necessarily question why fix this and what else could be done. Creativity is a different way and a more complex way of, of, of addressing complex situations. Creativity, in my mind, is still somewhat bounded but because it has, it, it, it has us looking at the resources, the research, the, 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 the challenges in front of us. So it keeps us anchored in what is. And I view that in the imagination as a completely unconstrained pure and unapplied experience that doesn't have a direct impact to solving any single solution, but overall positions us better to address more solutions in more ways, to make sure that what we need to do to serve our patients of the future, to serve our nurses of the future, and to preserve our nurses for the future is not only the fast response that we need today, but the imagination that will guide us into the future. I close by promising you that the National Library of Medicine will be a trusted partner in your imaginative journey. We have tools to help you. We have information to help you. And most importantly, we are a source of resource knowledge that can be trusted globally. And I am extremely proud of that. I ask you to reach out to me if you have thoughts that you'd like to share. I'm available on Twitter. Um, I have a, I keep write a blog that comes out every Wednesday morning and I'm available on email. So thank you for coming on this imaginative journey with me. And I look forward to your comments. Thanks very much. Thanks Patty for a great evening. Really a wonderful informative. You took the practical and then we also moved into a space where we can really uh, take a minute, reflect, open our hearts and our minds to seeing things differently. And who knew that the National Library of Medicine was a resource for those that information, which is really something I learned tonight and I'm very excited about. I wonder if you could take a couple, of, if anybody had a questions, if you could take a couple questions. Sure. Anybody have uh, any special questions for Patty? I, I don't uh, I don't actually have a question, but I, I think to um, uh, to add to what you just said, Patty, uh, uh, Mary, um, I, I was very interesting for me to hear more about the National Library of Medicine. And I, I think for everyone here to to hear about it, because I don't think as nurses, um, the it's something that we see as a um, as a resource for us. So two things, one, I thought of it more as a, a, as a, a library, a repository of, of books and articles, um, but to learn now how it's a repository also of data and yeah. to see how you're extending that, um, extending the, the sort of traditional uh, notion of a library well beyond that. And then for us as nursing informatics professionals here in uh, in the sort of the uh, eastern seaboard here, um, getting that word out that there's a a resource there for nurses, and how can uh, how can we get that word out in and make it more open uh, for nurses to use as a resource? So I, that's one piece that I that I took away from. So let me brag a little bit about some of our stuff, Denise, and talk a little more about what practicing nurses can get from the National Library of Medicine. So I've, I've said before, we're not your mother's library anymore, but we are a, uh, we are a vibrant, active source of information. Um, we, have, we, we do, in fact, index the literature, and we have 31 million citations in our PubMed repository. I guarantee you, you're not going to read all of them. 
What I can tell you though, is we're building tools, applying artificial intelligence and machine learning strategies so that when you do a PubMed search, the most relevant citations to your query are placed in front of you on the first page. We know that um, fully, uh, it, well, we've actually it's very rare to have a search on, in PubMed that doesn't return 20, 30 pages of citations. And yet we know that most people, 88% of people who do a PubMed search never go past the first page. So you wouldn't know if the best article for what you're looking for about the patient care problem or some, is on page two or three or five. So we're working on building at better search systems. We have a resource called My NCBI. It's, it's free, you can sign up for it. They, within the My NCBI, you can sign up to have uh, a, a short search sent to your mailbox every week. So what's new in your area, whether you're following a particular um, uh, uh, author or you're looking at, um, you're interested in bed stores or you're interested in, in, in home care technologies, we can give, you can get a search tailored specifically to your needs every week. We, we do provide through the network of the National Library of Medicine, in community based training, um, both for clinicians and as well as for patients. And we provide training on how to search PubMed. We provide training on how to use our genomic data banks. If you've got a high school kid who's a citizen science nut and really wants to look at how protein folding happens, we have a pathway for them to do that. Um, we are, uh, we do have. I, a responsibility to preserve the literature and preserve access to the literature. But we do sometimes live that out by going to court to protect rights of literature. So we we had we recently were involved in a suit with the FTC about um, a, a journal that one might consider a, not the first quality journal that was it was making claims that were unrealistic and unreasonable. And our our job was to 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 say there are standards for biomedical journal communications, and this company is not meeting their standards and therefore should not be able to do as they're acting. But we also helped shape the public uh, access policy that is available now. In, in 2013, we were part of a team that worked with the government to say any federally funded research should be immediately available to the public through a PubMed Central. So all researchers have to deposit their papers into PubMed Central if they're funded by NIH. You have to deposit PubMed Central so you can get at it right away. So often I'm asked, what's the difference between PubMed and PubMed Central? I get confusing. And why are there two of them? Why aren't they the same thing? And I have to say it took me two years after I got there to figure most of this out. PubMed is, is simply article titles and abstracts. And if there is a publicly accessible version of the article, there will be a link on the page that shows you that. Now, many of you work in universities and sometimes your universities have paid for it, it, essentially that's a specialized access so that the link for your university to John Wiley or to the, the Nature Art Journals is already present there. But many of you who are in practice who don't have libraries around to set that up are, I find, are, get stuck. There's no, it, there's no way from being in PubMed for you to get to articles that are behind a paywall. PubMed Central is full free text articles. They are, there's over seven and a half million articles in there right now. And these are articles of federally funded research. So there are journals that do not appear there. AJN has nothing in PubMed Central, but there are, there's nursing research available and freely accessible without a paywall. Since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, since March of 2020, we have worked very closely with the publishers to have all research papers related to SARS-CoV-2 or the coronavirus available without a paywall. So the publishers agreed to, if you will, drop the paywall on coronavirus related research. We also have preprints that are available so that research can be published very quickly. So we have a lot of things we're doing to make the literature available. We have Medline Plus which is a consumer level information resource. Medline Plus is different than specialty information services like AIDS Info or even the CDC's COVID-19 
website because it's a full service piece of, of patient information. So a person with HIV might also want to know something about nutrition or skincare, and that information is available through Medline Plus. But what is of interest to nursing informatics people, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, I'm sure several of you run into this, we can, you can make an uh, electronic link to Medline Plus through Medline Plus Connect from your electronic health record system in your institution and get patient specific tailored health information delivered back through this. And so if, you're, if you need more information, look up Medline Plus Connect, that will help you. We do lots of research. We do fund nursing research. We, fund, we spend about $75 million a year in research in the, in the community. We fund training programs in biomedical informatics and data science. And we also have, um, a, a, we fed, we have about $25 million of our intramural research program where you can come for a three-month period or a six-month period and, and learn more about our data banks or understand how to do protein folding research if you really want to see what a protein folding thing does. I'm really proud of it. It's really a great place to work. Could you just spend five minutes and talk about the research that you and Denise are doing? Or the work you and Denise sure. are doing? Yeah. Sure. We, um, Denise may, may want to, to, to start or you want me to start. So um, in, my, in my career um, at Wisconsin, I, I did a lot of work on home care and home care technologies. And we did, we visited homes. I, some of you who are as old enough to remember in the 1980s, we were putting terminals into the homes of people with AIDS to give them access to electronic support groups. So we, I was always interested in something about technology. Um, but what I realized is that every time you go into a house, the second time it's different than the first time. The newspapers were in the living room and then they're in the kitchen, the table was set now. It's not set. the house, all the stuff in the house moves all the time. And yet to understand home care, to understand how patients respond to environments that either are enabling or dismissive of their attempts to take care of themselves, we need to have a way to systematically study households. So when I was at Wisconsin, I started to work on a project um, at the Living Environments Laboratory called VizHome, where we actually used LIDAR scanners to recreate 3D models of houses and then would walk through them and understand why certain why people with different health problems organize their homes differently. Um, you know LIDAR, if you've ever looked at a house on Zillow and you see the house sort of floating in air, that's a LIDAR presentation of the house. Um, when, I went to, when I went to NIH, I wanted to continue my research in home care. And I also wanted to continue my research in understanding how to use technologies to support it. So my vision of our, of our research is that we will use immersive visual based technologies to understand the range of behaviors people need to do to take care of themselves. There are also valid uses of virtual reality where people rehearse new behaviors or rehearse new, uh, new skills. And that I'm sure there will be some people that wanna study that. That's not my primary focus. We started off uh, needing really good nursing expertise. And so I called my friend Denise who could walk both sides of the street, the technology and the nursing. And I said, would you like to join in this process? And has it been three years already, Denise? Three years. And we've, we've learned about each other. We've learned how to talk with each other and talk with our team. But basically what I needed is someone who had nursing credibility. I don't have that. I do have a license, but I don't have the credibility. So um, Denise, and Denise has done such things as um, held focus groups of home care nurses to identify what challenges are most commonly experienced and what would be amenable to, uh, to the intervention in a, in a, a uh, sorry, to a study in a virtual reality environment. And with her group of experts came up with um, a couple of, of problems, but in particular two, diet management for people who are on sodium restricted diets and medication management, especially for people who had to manage to self-manage a complex pill regime. So we built a virtual grocery store that has got 75,000 products in it now, and you can walk through and see uh, and make choices. And we, with Denise's help, we figured out how to get uh, nutrition label information into the, into the space so that as someone is selecting an object, they can see information about it. Um, we also built a home, a home, a kitchen where you could sit at a table or be close to a table and sort pills. Now, 
the, we were really lucky to attract this tremendous uh, clinical psychologist, neuropsychologist, whose ex expertise is in testing. And he's helping us break down some of the, the, the problems, the challenges that people have, like fatigue, like cognitive uh, distractions, and help us understand how we can study those in these virtual environments so we get a more realistic experience of the patient. Um, we also have, we have a, a wonderful young post uh, student, post-baccalaureate uh, student who's hoping to go to graduate school. And she's helping us. She, she got very interested, both she and the person before her got very interested in how do people walk around in virtual reality? So they've been studying pathways of walking through. So we do a, a number of, of different things. Um, we are, uh, we've probably, the lab, it took, a, it took two years to build a lab. Um, it, it took another year to get up to staffing. We've just run our first experiment with patients, uh, participants rather, to, 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 to determine can we evoke um, cognitive fatigue? And we sure can. Uh, we did some user testing of people, and we know that if you can put people in a VR environment and don't give them any instructions, they get really mad at you and they want to get out of it really fast. Um, we're learning a lot about head mounted devices. I used to work in a cave, which is a full room immersion. Now we're using head mounted devices. And um, we're also using uh, Denise and Sarah have a poster that's going to be presented in Amia next week that is helping us understand the intersection between virtual reality and informatics, because the data structures that we need to monitor and capture behaviors and actions in VR are not well developed, but informatics has the tools to build them. So anyway, Denise, you want to offer a couple comments? Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting uh, working with you, Patty, because um, it's, so your perspective on this work and what you're doing and building the informatics principles and looking to see whether virtual reality can be used as a research tool um, in, in this area of home care. And I came in and I just wanted to build something that we could use right away to help, to help people um, understand how to make better food choices in the grocery store. So I just wanted to build it and use it and solve a problem. And you wanted to you know, build foundationally, build it up so we would have a tool that we could uh, use uh, in research in many different ways. So it's been good to put us together. Yes, yes it has because uh, you know, I'm more in that um, how to, let's figure out how to solve this problem. And you are in the what if, yeah. and you, your imagination of, of, um, of, of where, this, where the work might bring us. So it's been an interesting uh, collaboration, partnership. It has. That's thrilling, how fascinating. Yeah. One more question, any question, one more question from the group, anybody? I don't see any questions and everybody all, everybody's already giving reviews and just saying what a wonderful evening it is. And it just, I think they're seeing the NLM in a whole new light and especially the work, work in virtual reality is exciting. And I can't wait to, uh, Denise presents her poster to Nenek mm -hmm. <laughs> next year. And, and, and maybe, we'll maybe let I'll Amy get a first review. We, we hope we'll have an article out in CIN in the next couple of months, maybe. We've got a really exciting piece coming up to explain how nursing yeah. sex with VR. Anyway, I want to thank the men and women who joined tonight. You've had a full day, and then you came to listen to me, and I really appreciate that. I think it's really, really important for us to, to, uh, to nurture our field, to recognize that if it's not going to be us, there will be no one who looks at the human response and we must be there. And thank you for what you're doing. Great. Thank you very, very much. much Patty. Have a nice Thanks evening, so everyone. Bye-bye now. Oh, virtual clap. <laughs>